Well, welcome back. So we're gonna just move ahead, keep on going on into this, um, the next session um, with a critical, it's one of the critical, most critical discussions of the day, the need for more counselors and mental health resources in our schools instead of police. Too often our girls are faced with punitive practices that penalize them for typical adolescent behavior. It's time for this practice to end and our next panel of experts all play a pivotal role in our movement for change. During our panel discussion, please remember to use the Q&A box to submit your questions and we will get to them, um, I guess, throughout the presentation. I would like to welcome Ashley Sawyer, the moderator, Dara Baldwin, Sadia Durrett, and Maria Fernandez. Take it away, Ashley. Thank you ladies for being here. Hello. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi, we're just waiting for um, all of our panelists to come together and then we'll get started. Great, fantastic, we're all here. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining. Thank you for joining this important conversation. So um, as I've mentioned, my name is Ashley. I use she and her pronouns and I am currently the Senior Director of Campaigns at Girls for Gender Equity based in Brooklyn, New York. I am going to quickly introduce just a quick overview of the panelists bios. I think all of their information is available to you in the app. I don't know how to pronounce the name of the app, WOVA, whatever the app, but please do read up on the work that they're doing and ways that you can support their work. But um, first I'll introduce Maria Fernandez. She is the Managing Director of Campaign Strategy at Advancer Project in Washington, D.C. I just admire Maria greatly, so I feel like that should be in the bio, but Maria supports the organizing strategies for the Ending the Schoolhouse and Jailhouse Program Partners. She is the campaign strategy strategist, excuse me, for the hashtag Police Free Schools campaign and works with the Advancement Project Justice team to call for police accountability. Maria, thank you so much for being willing to be on the panel. Um, next, I will introduce um, Dara Baldwin. I wanna add that Dara, like me, is also from Essex County, New Jersey. And so I just like to shout out all the Jersey folks. Um, Dara is the Director of National Policy for the Center for Disability Rights. The CDR is a nonprofit community-based advocacy and service organization for people with all types of disabilities. CDR uses a peer model where people with disabilities show other people with disabilities how to live independently and advocate for themselves. And um, I'm really happy to have you. Thank you for joining our conversation and thank you for your work in the disability justice movement and in um, the racial justice movement. Thank you for joining. And last but certainly not least, I am so excited to have Saudia with us. Saudia Durant is the is a racial justice organizer with the Abolitionist Law Center in Pennsylvania. She received a bachelor's in broadcast journalism and organized one of the first and largest labor union agreements with food service workers in the Philadelphia International Airport through Unite Here. Uh, so I mean, Saudia has an amazing bio, so I encourage folks to take a look and read it. But I know her from her amazing work with the Philadelphia Student Union as a youth organizer, developing young people to advocate and organize for educational justice and focused on issues like school funding, toxic school conditions, and the school to prison pipeline. I am so grateful that you all were willing to join us. Thank you, Sadia. And I feel like it's been so long. We've been in the remote world, the virtual world for so long. I feel like I saw, uh, Dara saw you in March 2020, right before the world changed. Like, it's been so long since I've seen some of you in human life, but I hope that we can bring, um, you know, like real life energy to this conversation, even though we're not able to hug each other and look into each other's eyes and give each other the kind of care that we need. With that said, I will not go too much longer. I'm just gonna give a little bit of a grounding for those of us who are listening. I am a person who likes to know my audience and likes to know, you know, who are we in conversation with? It doesn't make sense to have panels just for us to talk because I could talk all day, but if we're not getting to the meat of something, we're not getting for a less, you know, for lack of a less, uh, more vegetarian term, but if we're not getting to the heart of the matter, what is the point of being here unless we're gonna move people into action? So just know that some of you might have come here being like, what are the ways that we can just have more counselors and not, you know, more counselors and that's gonna solve all the problems, but we're gonna get into something a little bit deeper. I know that, you know, some folks even challenge that counseling, not criminalization, counselors, not cops, 
framing, right? Like there's more to it that we have to get to. So I'm just gonna name that we are gonna um, dig in a little bit. First, what does the term criminalization mean? I use that term. And when I think of the term, I, I borrow it from scholars like Dr. Monique Morris. Everybody should read her book, Push Out, if you have not already. But I think of the term um, as a way to describe the policies and practices which exclude punish and increase the likelihood that young people will experience harm in and around school in their communities. In our context, particularly we're talking about young folks, we're talking about Black girls. Criminalization can show up like suspensions, expulsions, it can show up as arrests, and it can show up in any of the ways that adults or people with power um, tell young people that you're not welcome here, that you don't belong here, and push them into the clutches of the criminal punishment system. Um, with that, I want to ask all of the panelists, what brings each of you into this conversation? Why are you involved in the movement to end the criminalization of Black girls and young people? And we can just start with whoever feels ready to go. Oh, okay, I'll jump in. Hot, peace and blessings, everyone. Um, Dara Baldwin, Director of National Policy. I'm in a hotel. I'm in, in New York City this week um, doing a lot of different things. But thank you, for Gwen's Girls, for having me and to be on this amazing panel with these wonderful women. What brings me to this is I am. I am a, you know, a Black woman. Um, as I put in the chat box, I grew up in Newark, New Jersey, Brick City. Um, I'm much older than all of you. And people look at me, don't think this, but I grew up in the 80s crack cocaine and you know most um I have a large family I have about 30 um cousins my father's side my grandmother adopted a lot of children and then they had six and seven children and out of us only three of us graduated high school and I'm the only woman at, out of those three the other two were boys um my cousin who's my mother's godchild so she made sure he graduated and my half brother um, my other brother, my other family members were either locked up, um, uh, used in ways they should not have been used. Um, and it always amazed me when I came to do policy where I started working in education. I was one, I was, I was like, I got to do this work and talking to people and scholars who did this. And it was like, how do we find a child's talent? And I was like, I don't understand how you scholars and people can't do that when the people on the street can do it. They did it to my cousins. They watched them in the playground. They said, okay, she'll be a good runner. He's good with math. This one can do that. And they pick, plucked and picked them. And we had no services, right? There were no boys and girls clubs that were open or they were just run down. And so for me, this is personal because of my life. I'm still very connected to Newark, New Jersey. And then again, I'm here in New York. I come to New York. My center is headquartered in New York. So I come here one week a month now that we can travel. Um, and so it's very important to me. And the final thing I'll say is, as a Black woman who has been blessed to have an education, um, I have a master's degree. Um, and who has been able to have these connections and sit in the spaces I've sat. I've sat at a table with President Obama. I'm sitting at tables with President Biden. I better use that and I better make some changes in my, my people's lives. And what better people than our young people, um, LGBTQ, you know, girls, those who are non-binary. Um, I'm not going to be blessed with this and not use it. I could jump in. Um... I'm just so excited to be part of this conversation. I wrote it in the chat, but anything Ashley invites me to, I'm like, I have to be there. So just super grateful and thank you for your work and what you do. Um, I started organizing when I was a young person. Uh, so I grew up in the Bronx um, and this has been my everyday experience. Uh, so when I was 15, I started doing work around uh, kind of all the things that impact young people and then communities. Uh, and came across a lot of uh, what we now call state violence or state sanctioned violence, right? So thinking about all the ways that educational institutions uh, criminalize, abuse, uh, young people and families and communities, particularly black communities, uh, thinking about from policing to school closures and privatization, right? All the things that make it so that we are barely holding on to our existence in our communities. And so that has just been what brought me into the space and I've never left. Um, I have been blessed to be able to organize with young people who are just so brave, um, so incredible and so visionary and who teach me every day about what it means to be uh, an abolitionist, what it means to challenge institutions of violence. Um, and then also just, uh, I think what allows me to stay in this work is that I know I have never met a young person, particularly a black girl who never wanted to learn, 
but I have seen day in and day out institutions that refuse to teach uh, and refuse to love uh, and help develop the young people that I work with. Um, so that's how I got involved. Um, I've been doing organizing for a little bit over, I guess, 17 years now um, in multiple capacities. And one of the, the best experiences is to be able to be in space uh, and support young people to fight for the world that they wanna create. Wow, that was amazing. Uh, I'm also so excited to be here. And I really feel like what brought me to this conversation was feeling like I would be talking with family and friends uh, more than anything. So much appreciations for the space. Um, and I think, yeah, very similarly, I think what brings me to this conversation is I've personally experienced a lot of traumas that I think have helped me to grow, to feel committed to protecting and developing Black girls and Black women's leadership in the movement. And I think I've seen so many spaces that have deprioritized, um, distrusted Black girls and Black women's leadership. Um, and for me, it just feels like a really important, uh, just like life mission um, in any organizing space that I go into. And I think also too, I've done so many different sort of facets of organizing where every single space that I organize, I always arrived at this same issue of everything being centered in state violence and feeling like if organizing isn't centered in dismantling the ways that the state chooses to legalize weaponizing our bodies, we weaponizing our neighborhoods and our homes, then there would be a constant uh, just lack of focus in what our communities really need. Um, and for me, you know, I'm also a mama. I have a four-year-old little black girl. And for me, the stories that I have heard from doing youth organizing have broken my spirit so many times of what black girls have had to eat and have had to sit with walking into school, walking out, going home in the neighborhood. And for me, this work is a commitment because I would hope that when my daughter is a teenager or a young person, she would have folks fighting for her the same way that I fight for other black girls. So she's really what, what keeps me grounded and motivated and connected in this work. Because uh, it's a generational responsibility for sure. Thank you all so much for the work and that you've done, the experiences that you bring to this this work, and just for who being who you are. I appreciate all of you um, for sharing and being vulnerable with the audience. So I ask that question because it's important for folks to know who we are, what we're bringing to the table. So the next question is sort of pointed. I really want to get to the heart of like, what is it we're trying to, to shift and what are the practices and patterns that we need to shift all of us? So who are some of the key stakeholders in the criminalization of Black girls and what are the ways that we can change their behavior? And let's just be specific. And this is not about, you know, when I think about this question, I didn't think about, you know, this particular teacher on March 15, 2003, did this thing. Although there has, you know, we do need to have conversations about what does it mean for young people that get accountability for the folks who have harmed them. But really what I want to talk about are like, what are the, who has power in the conversation around criminalization? What is their power? What do we want to see them do differently, better? And where do, and also in some cases, like, how do we want to get them out of the roles that they're in? I would love to hear your insight around that question. go because I, I just read the, the article about the, the transfer of the 5,000 NYPD um, officers. And I'm just like heated, right? Because the, those were explicit decisions that were made at a city council level, at a mayoral level uh, that continue to perpetuate violence and a direct opposition to the demands that young people, particularly black girls in these organizations in uh, girls for gender equity who've been demanding the complete elimination of school policing systems. So I'm like heated and mad and all those things. Um, so I think really clearly the, the stakeholders, I think there's like schools as an institution. So the system of education um, and then the carceral actors within the system of education that continue to perpetuate violence uh, from all the way from the way they talk to young people in the classroom, the way classrooms are set up um, so that's educators. I often say that educators can either be oppressors or liberators. They're the gatekeepers of the school to prison pipeline. They make decisions every day. And who is an educator matters in the classroom. Um, from at school administration, right? So the policies and the practices that are uh, 
happening in schools from dress code, right? To the, the policing of, of just the, the bodies of black girls, all the way to, to policing, right? Like, and police officers in schools. So it's an entire system of criminalization and policing. Um, and then city council, right? Or however your local municipalities are structured, aldermen, council members, right? Uh, mayor, and then the department of education, depending on who has the power, because I think policing manifests differently and who's accountable to who changes depending on the city, but absolutely is a system uh, and then there are actors that play in that system daily, right? Who make explicit decisions. And I wanna make that clear because uh, they could choose to be different. They could choose to have different policies. They could choose to organize, to change the way policies and practices are happening in school. Um, so I think that's very important to note uh, because I think oftentimes the, the blame gets put on young people, right? We hear it every day. If you just dress differently, if we just change your, your spaghetti straps, if you just change your hair, um, if you just stop talking, why are you so loud? Why are you so extra, right? Like all that, that, that perpetuates the stereotypes of black women and girls, right? That then are become excuses that they use to criminalize young people that are absolutely false, that are absolutely racist, um, that are patriarchal, um, that are sexist. So I think all of those, that's a long answer, but all of, I think the systems work together from education to family care, to departments of, right? Like all of those institutions work together to uphold, right? These racist policies that continue to criminalize young people and their actors that play a part of it. And all of them have power. It's just the differentiation of power. Um, so that's, that's my answer. <laughs> Can I jump in and add on to that? I thought that was absolutely brilliant, Maria, and definitely echo that. And just some pieces or some elements that I wanted to add to that speaks to Philly conditions specifically. I think COVID revealed a lot, right, of the capabilities that have always existed in these school districts to redefine and reorganize what's possible versus what is not, right? Pre-COVID, you know, schools were, uh, Philly schools, the infrastructures were horrific, like students, teachers being exposed to cancer because of asbestos um, inside of school buildings and administrators and school district administrators knowing this, right? But saying, well, we don't really have the money or the priorities to really figure out how to tackle this, right? And at the same time that they were doing that, they were sitting on $30 million that they spend to how school police officers who do nothing but criminalize, who sit there, who weaponize Black girls' bodies and skirts, right, who will treat any little thing as if it's a crime and deciphering how young people interact with one another, COVID hits, right? So now schools are closed. Young people are forced to learn from home. The school district wasn't even prepared on how young people were going to have access to Chromebooks unless you went to a magnet or a private or a charter school, right? Students who are going to uh, public schools literally went home with no plan of how they would have access to internet for free, access to Chromebooks, access to meals, right? So COVID exposed a lot of things that the school district had not prepared while preparing to weaponize school buildings that they then couldn't run. Right, so we're talking about $30 million that was wasted to actually make sure you can educate students without them being forced, uh, without them being forced to be exposed to COVID, right? Then magically, six months later, when the school board opens up public discussion meetings, trying to reopen schools during September of 2020, still in the thick of it, right? Where folks weren't even sure if they were gonna go out and bring something home, God forbid, to their grandmother, right? The school tried to reopen the school district tried to reopen its buildings and had four to five hours of parents calling, giving testimonies, complain, complaining, saying, where was the community survey on you doing this? Who are you going into your offices? And from that, they were able to realize, oh, actually, maybe we can't close down our schools. And I think that was a testament to this sort of false narrative of how much power school board and administrators have and what they're willing and not willing to do, right? Mutual aid networks also revealed a lot of things that those that have the powers that be do not use the resources that they can to release people. And I agree with everything that Maria said, right? Parents, teachers, teacher unions, administrators, paraprofessionals all have so much stake to really listen to young people and to use that and to use their organizing right power to really challenge on what the school district does and doesn't do. 
Well, amen to both of that, to both my sisters there. And I'm going to go right in and be honest. So those of you who don't know me, you will understand and know. I'm very blunt, very straightforward. In those meetings I told you in the White House and stuff, I don't know why they still invite me because I'm going to tell them um, this is wrong. And I don't have the time to play games with these people. So let's be real. Let's get some real names here. The NEA, the National Education Association. The AFT, the Association for Federal Teachers. Um, that Both of them unions, they keep playing games they keep talking to communities and saying oh we we don't want police officers in school they say that to you all in the community but when they get to dc they don't say that to the white house they don't say that to congress there is no statement on record from nea or aft that says get these police officers out of school they want to see here randy weingarten on a thursday night she said oh no teachers should not the school should not be mandated to be vaccinated and when all in white folks called her and told her what are you doing and what are you saying on Sunday morning at 10 30 she was gonna meet the press saying oh I'm sorry I made a mistake everybody should be mandated there should be mandated vaccination for everybody in the school so you know AFT is a union for everybody in the school this is from the from the um janitors on up right this thing i do transportation people don't know this school crossing guards were moved they used to report to put to the principals of the schools now school crossing guards report to police officers and law enforcement you know who did that these national safety school programs and safe routes to school that are run by white women who told us the E of enforcement and transportation that you black women are angry. And that E in enforcement is not the same as the E of enforcement that Black Lives Matter is fighting for. And then what happened? The reckoning of summer 2020 and the data came out, which we told them at a higher rate, black and brown folks are killed by traffic violations. And that is our students going back and forth to school. What child do you know doesn't go back and forth to school and have little arguments with their sister? I don't like you. By the time they get to school, they love each other. Okay, so really give me a break here. Uh, DOJ, the Department of Justice, COPS program, the community um, policing services, because that's where the funds come and go to these SROs. And while I'm on it, NARO, the National Association for SROs, they are a problem. And we as Black people need to call them out. Those people who are out there who are educators, I don't care if you are higher ed or in elementary or in high school. Y'all need to get on the phones and tell NEA and AFT enough of playing games with black people's lives. Most of their members are black women. Let us all be real here. And Randy Weingarten, as a white woman, you don't get to tell us about who we feel should be protected. And that telling Dr. Mar you want to tell my sorority sister, Monique Morris, I'm a, I'm a Delta. We all Delta women too up in here. You're not going to tell her that push out is so important. We want to do a panel with you. We want to do all of this with you. But you won't tell the Black students, Black girls, we're going to take the law enforcement out of your schools. So until NEA and AFT say that, they are the, the main problem. The DOJ is a problem. You have a leader, you have an attorney general and assistant attorney general, Benita Gupta, who used to be there, who used to fight all the time, who will not say that law enforcement should not be in schools. All right. Finally, Congress members, the CBC, the Congressional Black Caucus, again, here we go, everybody out here talking about George Floyd, and it's such a horrible thing, and when they had the, um, conviction of Chauvin. Oh my God, this is so horrible. But you all will not say that law enforcement should not be in schools. Why? Because you all think it's safety because of threat assessments and security. And don't get me wrong, because of school shootings, right? Because white folks have a larger voice with you than we do. And until the CBC comes out and says, we don't want law enforcement in schools yet, they are playing games with us. And I tell these people all the time, 93% of Black people came out and voted and put you Democrats in office. Stop giving us 40%. It was 47% of white folks. Them white folks couldn't even get to 50 for you all to get in the office. And 57% of white women voted for Trump. So we got some serious problems here when your dedication is to those people and not to the people who put you in office. So if you have a Black Congress member who has not come out and said, Students, especially girls, should not be going to school with law enforcement touching their bodies and looking at their bodies and slamming them on the ground. Then you tell them you will not have my vote and we will primary somebody against you. And President Biden is another one. He's going to sit here, same thing. He's smiling with his hand. 
Oh, Derek Chauvin did a, you know, press conference with, with Vice President Harris. And with the left hand, two days later, put $660 billion of money extra into law enforcement. These people are playing games with us and they need to hear this is enough. This, these are the groups, NEA, AFT, right? I'm gonna say it over and over again. And Congress and DOJ, they need to stop playing games with black people's lives and having us come out and vote for you and you treat us like this. Oh, I love this panel. I love this panel. Um, because I think what happens in a lot of our conversations about ending criminalization and, and increasing access to counselors, we get lost about where the power is and we get we just get caught up in um, things that are not actually gonna change. I want the conversations that we had to be the building blocks to lead us to actually changing what black girls experience on a day to day. If our work doesn't change the lived experiences, then we're just chit chat and having a good time. So I heard a couple of really important things that I just want to put a fine point on for everybody to listen. I heard government plays a critical role, right? Like people pay tax dollars for money to go, you know, to infrastructure, infrastructure, excuse me, services, education, but that money is dead goes into a pot that's largely going into law enforcement. And then, you know, I'm oversimplifying it a little bit, but it really is. We're seeing millions of dollars being placed in one area. And that tells us what the priorities are. That tells us as community members, the people who are in government, people who have power, they think that the priority should be the COPS program. For folks who are not familiar, the COPS program is a federal initiative that provides resources for school districts to have COPS in and around their schools. That money has been around for a couple of decades now, but what we find is that there isn't something comparable to make sure that there's resources available for um, young people to have access to the kinds of programs and things that they want in school. That money also is, um, it came up as a result of the war on drugs. We have to understand the context of how that conversation happened. And I heard you talk about teachers unions. I heard us talk about um, local city council, local departments of education. And what I've seen over the past year or so, and um, Dara, you called it the reckoning of 2020. And I'm holding on to that. The rec That's what it was. It was a reckoning. People saying like, you have to be accountable for what you did to George Floyd and how that fits into this larger system of systemic racism, right? Like what you did to Breonna Taylor, what you did to Tony McDade, that's a part of this larger conversation. The two are not unrelated. I wanna make sure folks are connecting the dots. Like what happened last summer is directly connected to what we see happening in our schools. But what I'm hearing is that there are people who have power who are often saying that they care about young people. Like I think in certain um, camps, people with power are saying, we are on board, we're on board, we're on board, but then when it's time to them for them to reallocate money, they won't. And in my mind, what gets in the way is there's an underlying belief, and I'm a moderator, but I'm also a panelist, so here we are. There's an underlying belief that Black children, we got to have a few cops. We've got to have a few of them. And I think the underlying belief is that these kids are violent they're dangerous, they're harmful. What about, because I saw it in the app, so I'm just gonna you know, name what I saw, the questions that were coming up in the app. You know, What am I supposed to do? When am I supposed to refer a young person to the police versus a counselor? And I really was like, ooh, that's, I wanna talk to the person who asked that question because I wanna bring you in and ask you, where can we reconsider that whole frame of, you know, when do I refer the child to the police? And what are the ways that um, we think about you know, what if our children are not inherently bad? What if young people are not inherently violent? And I know that there's some fear that comes up for folks who they're like, well, if we don't have police, what will we do when the kids do harm or violence? And we're not asking ourselves, where is this harm and violence coming from? You know, what are the ways that we're creating the conditions for young people to feel like they are in competition with one another? Anyway, we'll come back to this because I do want us to get into the meat of like, when people walk away from this conversation, what are the things that they need to be sitting with that makes us uncomfortable, all of us? How can we be uncomfortable? Because that's where we're gonna grow. Um, one of the things that you all were talking about was, Maria, I think you gave an example about like dress code. That's an example of the ways that black girls in particular get punished in school. They're told, you know, you're wearing a midriff shirt or a skirt that's too short. And, you know, we hear the examples with girls for gender equity. If the young person says, no, I'm not going to put on that dirty sweatshirt from the loss of bound. I'm not going to change my, you know, clothing. And then the teacher's like, well, now you're suspended. And so it's not a dress code suspension. It's a suspension for willful defiance or disobedience. And that gets lost. And what I 
feel like comes up underneath that is like this desire to control young people. You're not wearing what I think as an adult you should be wearing, and so now I want to control you. And I also see that come up in the disability context. Young people are showing up as their full selves. Young people who are neurodivergent are showing up as their full selves, and the schools respond to them in a harsh way. And Dara, I would love to hear you talk to us or help us understand what are the ways that the disability justice movement and the racial justice movement, inter and the movement to end youth criminalization intersect with each other? How are these things coming together? Sure, no, thank you for that. So those people who don't know, just real quick, um, and I put some, um, I'll put resources in the chat box on more around how to create, um, you know, a more human rights education school. That's from Dignities in Schools. Um, they have a whole program around it. Um, if you need training and conversation, and if you want to join Dignity Schools, do that. So uh, many people don't know disability justice is different from disability rights. You hear a lot about disability rights. Disability rights centers white folks and white folks issues. And after many years of fighting and arguing and back and forth with the disability rights community, who told Black people, specifically Black women, as always, Black women stepping forward and some Black queer women too, right, saying, you know, the disability rights community said your disability is more important than your being Black or you being a woman. And that just, it, it was not sitting well with them. And so about five years ago, a group of young um, uh, women of color, queer women, created disability justice. And I'll put it in the chat, but there's a link to their, we have 10 principles. The first one is intersectionality. That, right, we have what's called multi-marginalizations, many things in our life. There's an African-American transgender woman who is a refugee formerly incarcerated. They exist, and all of those marginalizations have to be a part of our work. The 10th one is collective liberation. Whatever we do in our work that is social justice that is i am a federal registered lobbyist with a lobby number and everything there's only four black women in the country out of fifty thousand lobbyists that are in that federal registry book so you know this um a lot of people in dc do advocacy work i'm a federal lobbyist which means i can go on the hill and say you better not vote for that bill advocates can't do that so i just say this to you so i say that to say that is what we have to fight for. And when I am a lobbyist, people say that's an ugly thing. I do social justice. The bills I get passed help everybody. That is social. Social is everyone. And so um, a, a tobacco lobbyist is just going to do tobacco, right? That's the difference between lobbyists. So anyway, because my father was like, You're, you can't be a lobbyist. And I was like, dad, I'm going to be a social justice lobbyist. So I say that. And in disability justice, what we try to tell people, you know, we work really, not tell, but help and work with people. Um, Black Lives Matter, BYP 100. Um, movement for Black Lives, and they've taken this on. Carrie Gray, Justice Shorter, Jen White, Johnson, and I'll put their information in the chat box. You can follow them on um, uh, all social media. They created hashtag Black Disabled Lives Matter. And what we say is that if you center Black just, uh, disability justice, you will cover everyone because we <clears throat> talk about all people in all places where they are. Another principle is that it is led by the people. Those closest to the problem are the ones who have the solutions. And so we come from that space. And so that's what we bring to this work. We are members of the Federal School Discipline Coalition, which is started and convened in 2008 by Christopher Scott, um, who is an amazing advocate and policy person at OSF, Open Society Foundation, Open Society Policy Center. Um, and so that's how we do it. And what we do is say, you know, we know the data shows. If you look at the data, at a higher rate, students with disabilities, specifically young girls, queer, non-binary, are harmed, abused, and often killed by law enforcement. Um, because also what's happening, these our teachers and, and people, like we said, if I don't send them to the police, you know, who would I send them, are not trained. We need to start also in the universities when we start training elementary education teachers and educators and people who are gonna be in the school. I don't care, I don't care if you, if you sweep on the floor, you need to be educated about disabilities. You need to be educated about children in their mind and what's going on. And that's not happening. And so we center that in our work. Um, and we center the fact that listening to youth, listen, we have a whole youth 
community that lead us. They come on, we have meetings on the Hill. So all you young people out there, if you want to come and talk to your Congress, just hit me up on there and we'll get you on the call. Are you from Detroit? Are you from California? We talked to Representative Auntie Maxie Waters and her staff and you want to join in? That's who they need to hear from. They don't need to hear from me. They need to hear from you guys saying, I feel unsafe in school. I don't want to go to school. And that's how we bring this together. That's racial justice. Racial justice is also hearing from the people. And the last thing I'll say, we, I, we also do not engage in this anti-racism. Like, yeah, okay, I want you to be anti-racist. But what I need these people to be is pro-Black. I need you to push forward the fact, yeah, you can be, because they'll be anti-racist. And oh, yeah, I don't believe in that. That's that whole thing about behind the scenes. But when it comes to us telling, and that means that in every aspect of everything I do. So when I say to you that marijuana should be uh, not be criminalized, oh, no, but we can't believe in that. That's not anti-racist, right? That You think it is. They say, well, we're anti-racist because we don't believe they should be arrested. But being pro-Black is saying that marijuana should be legalized or these things should happen to our people, that enforcement should be removed from schools. That's being pro-Black. Why? Because it's harming Black people, and this is what Black people are asking for. So that's how we bring forward disability justice, and that's all in those 10 principles. Thank you so much. I know we're getting deep into it and I know we're, we're starting to run a little low on time just to get, I wanna be able to get to as many of the questions as possible and maybe even leave some time for some Q and A. Um, so the next question is for Sadia, because you were talking about young folks and I, I think it's now an important time to talk about, you know, we're all adults on this panel. So how can we, you know, bring young people into the conversation a little bit? And I would love to hear you talk to us about some of the reasons that young people have organized around police free schools in Philadelphia? Like what is bringing them into this movement? What is bringing them into this conversation? Thanks for that amazing question, Ashley, because I do think it's very important to center, yeah, what would compel a young person to take on uh, such a complex and radical and liberatory, right, call of action when most adults or most communities have not been prepared for that conversation, right? I think material contradictions are sort of what comes to mind when I think about the reasons that young people have stepped into calling for police free schools in Philly. I think there is a very clear tale of the haves and the have nots that school district administrators um, are comfortable with allowing to happen. We've had a significant amount of hospitals and schools closing in Philadelphia, Philadelphia year after year. Uh, in like the mid 20s, there were uh, mid like 2010, 2011, 2012, that time range, right? We were going through a severe uh, budget deficit crisis, we had like 23 schools that were closed, right? School communities closed and shut down. And after that happened, right, the justification was, well, we don't have enough money to fund these schools, right? We don't see enough students showing up into the classroom, filling out seats, right? We don't have proof or evidence that this building should stay open, right? So maybe we shouldn't provide it since students aren't going there, right? Which is a contradiction because you would think if students aren't showing up or or arriving, you might want to investigate into where young people are going and how they're being pushed out of their schools. But that didn't happen, right? They decided to instead build luxury apartments going for two, three, four thousand dollars for a one bedroom, knowing that the average single family household in Philadelphia could barely afford a one or two bedroom apartment, right, in Philly. So seeing schools close, right, having metal detectors and security bar and security uh, cameras placed inside of schools while art programs, athletic programs, cultural programs being shut down, right? We have seen so many deep divestments into the, the things that would compel a young person to want to feel safe, to want to feel loved, to not just be treated as a robot who's expected to just fill out a test and not actually have a community and a school environment where they're empowered to actually learn. Um, I think there's so many different contradictions that have come up inside of schools where young people are saying, how can the school district have such a deep investment where they can prioritize security and police as something untouched when it comes to money, right? Like school district officials will get angry and frustrated. How dare you ask us to have less cops in the schools, right? Never mind what young people are seeing in the news of young teenagers being shot to death 
and left to bleed, you know, in the dead of August, in the dead of summertime, right? For their bodies to cook in the streets like Michael Brown, right? Never mind what young people are seeing when they're actively watching them being gunned down by state authorities falsely framed as protectors of life. And you're gonna then put them into buildings that you can barely keep operational. You can barely fund having enough teachers and teaching assistants in a classroom. Teachers are buying their own copy books out of their pocket and out of their salary to make sure that enough young people have that. Young people witnessed all these contradictions of what is important for young people to feel safe to learn and what is not. And I think that is what has truly compelled. On top of that, I think we also have to look at the fact that the moment that we're in is a part of a longer history and a larger movement, right, of these contradictions in our communities. When young people are learning about or studying the civil rights movement, right, the Black Power movement, the Black Liberation movement, right, the Puerto Rican movement, like all these movements, right, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago, of people saying our communities have nothing that we need, and yet we're compelled to violence with no jobs and no housing. Young people are making these connections, right, that history is repeating constantly, and they are the ones that are suffering. And I think a lot of those conditions, while at the same time we see larger political parties exploiting these same movements that they then don't fund, don't support, don't uplift, will say, yeah, you know, it's Martin Luther King Day. Let's celebrate that. And then we'll turn around and say, I don't support defund the police. I don't support communities asking for funding to their, to their schools instead of cops who tell young people, call young people in to their faces walking back and forth to school. And you're gonna say a district official is gonna say that cop is more important to be in the classroom than a young person feeling safe. Contradictions like that are what have compelled young people to say, it is us who are directly impacted by these conditions and have the least amount of power, the least amount of access to decision making. School districts will set up boards for adults who haven't been in schools in God knows how long, who don't understand the climate or the conditions, or who are looking at their job as a bureaucratic authority versus something around education and liberation, right? Those folks will have decision making authority and young people will be given advisory positions. Here's what I think you should do, but you don't have to listen to me. Those kind of contradictions of belittling and pacifying um, young people's leadership and decision making and crippling them to be dependent on an institution that has no other alternative than violence is what I think has compelled people in Philly, especially because our city is going through one of the worst one of the worst moments in terms of inner community violence. And that is a product of the violence from COVID and from years worth of, of exploitation. So those are what I would say have been the things that have compelled our young people. Thank you so much. And I, I just, ha I do want us to sit for a moment with what you said, because I think it's heavy. And sometimes we can skip over the fact that like we have lost so many people to COVID and it has been so painful, even if you didn't get sick, the, the economic impact of it. And then also when you talk about Mike Brown, I always, you know, it chills me. And I think about people like Micaiah Bryant and Mike Brown, young people see that, young people feel that that pain shows up with them when they come into school, that pain is with them everywhere they go. And I just don't want us to get so, us as in the folks on this panel, the folks in the audience, to get so accustomed to hearing about Black death and murder and being like, yep, that's another statistic. Keep going, keep going, next question. Like, I wanna pause. We just talked about black children getting killed. Babies, children did not get to see, you know, their 21st birthday. Like we, and that affects us and that affects young people. They, they see it, they know it, they feel it. Even if they use different words to talk about it, we're all feeling this pain. And I just don't want us to get accustomed to talking about black death and being like, okay, next question. Um, Maria, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about the national momentum, because I think that some people say like, this can't be one, like how could you really have police free schools? Like, how is that possible? What does that look like? Can you talk about us, talk to us about the examples of what's been happening across the country? Yeah, absolutely. Um, ooh, Sadia. Um, 
So I think I want to, uh, sorry, um, just hone in on some of the pieces that, that Saudia was talking about, how this is the demand around removing police from schools, the demand around controlling uh, Black communities, being able to control the kind of education and self-determining the kind of education uh, that our communities want and need is uh, didn't start in 2020. It has been a long, like the, the years of organizing that groups have done, that young people have done, that communities have done, live in a continuum. Um, so uh, I get to be part, part of my work is to help support the building of the National Campaign for Police-Free Schools, uh, which has been in the, the, the works and in the making um, officially after the assault at Spring Valley in 2015, uh, when we, the world watched as Shakara was flipped over the desk by a white police officer in Columbia, South Carolina, and Naya Kenny uh, intervened and said, stop it and recorded it, right? Um, and that level of police violence uh, kind of shocked a lot of people who weren't thinking about police in schools, right? Um, but young people, but this had been the experience of young people, particularly Black girls, for decades. Uh, so we've been building with the Alliance for Educational Justice, uh, which is our national network of youth organizing groups, uh, to help advance this national campaign, again, calling for the removal of police-free schools as just the beginning of struggle. Uh, so we now have 26 organizations uh, of young people, organizers across the country who have been organizing and winning and fighting these incredible hard battles and who have a clear vision for what police free schools means. So I think oftentimes we know that demands get co-opted uh, and people talk about, well, you know what, why don't we just place the cop outside? And we're like, no, it is beyond that, right? We're calling for the complete dismantle of school policing infrastructure, culture, and practice. So again, not just the removal of police from schools, but we want to end policing in all its way, it forms and manifestations. Um, to end school militarization and surveillance, one of the biggest things that we saw coming out of the uprisings in Ferguson was the 1033 program and these police departments that have military grade weapons. Guess what? Those are in schools too, right? Through the 1033 program and uh, young people in Los Angeles through the Labor Community Strategy Center went back home after witnessing the uprisings in Ferguson and realized that the Los Angeles school police department, the largest official police school police department in the country had M16s, grenade launchers, and tanks, a school police department. And they organized for two and a half years to be able to get the department to send those weapons back and formally apologize to young people, right? So we're talking about the militarization and surveillance that's happening in our schools. I can't help but say the Minneapolis school district was raised, right? Like we were on a call when the vote happened um, and it moved us, right? But they ended their, police, their school police contract and then reinvested $355,000 to school surveillance, right? So it's policing by another name and form, right? So for us, we want to end all of those things. But most importantly, we have a vision for a liberatory education system, right? So it talks, it, it goes beyond the policing, but it's about shifting the power in schools, centering the, the well-being, the nurturing, the development of young people, and bringing community back into school, right? So for us, that is what police-free schools means, nothing short of that. So you can take a cop out and put him in the neighborhood. That's not police-free schools, because <laughs> those young people leave school and go into their communities and see police and police violence. So there have been so many victories. Uh, wanted to shout out Freedom Inc. Um, in Madison, Wisconsin, who were able to win and force a cop school board president to end the contract. And now they're fighting again to redefine what a uh, community looks like without policing and po uh, police in schools and investing in the wellness and brilliance of black young people. Uh, Oakland with the Black Organizing Project who uh, had a 10 year fight after um, Raheem Brown was killed by Oakland Unified School Police Sergeant at a school dance, right? 10 year fight, they were able to eliminate the Oakland Unified School Police Department and are now in a fight to actually build community power um, and are centering black young people, black parents, black families and those conversations. Uh, in Phoenix with Puente Human Rights Movement, they were able to um, force the school board not to uh, reauthorize the school police contract with the Phoenix Police Department, which is what I think the fifth uh, most dangerous police department in the country. They kill more people per capita, right, than the majority of police departments. Um, then uh, some victories that came out of San Francisco with Coleman Advocates for Children and Youth uh, in Alexandria here in the DMV in Virginia. 
Um, and then some incredible fights in Chicago and Los Angeles, right? So we know that, that again, removing police or ending contracts is just the beginning of struggle. But I want to just make something clear that these districts don't want police-free schools. They're finding ways. They're, in, they're backtracking on the school board decisions. Uh, they're continuing to fund policing by other means. They're refusing to invest in the wellness of young people. Uh, so we have a fight ahead of us because the implementation is the battle. And again, young people have a vision for education that is larger than just removing the police from schools and we have to understand that so i get all the time right like well what about policing no we mean policing we mean the the discipline policies we mean the educators that are in the classroom we mean all the ways in which young people are controlled right because school systems uh are um and police departments are about social control so they're about controlling particularly the behavior the movement the mind of black children of queer and trans young people, of students with disabilities, of immigrant young people, of indigenous young people. Those are, that's the function of education in this country. It hasn't shifted. So we have to fight, right, to be able to determine the kind of education that young people want, that families want. And that's the work that we're doing. And for us, again, police-free schools is not just about police. It is about a larger vision grounded in abolition that centers the needs, the well-being of community. Um, so that's, Thank you. It's about what we're building. I hear Ruth Wilson, Wilson, Ruth Wilson Gilmore in my head. Abolition is not just about the absence. It's about the presence. It's like what we want, what we want to build. So the school districts that are kind of like paying lip service and like giving us a win, but then doing something, creating another like similar version, we, that's not what we want. We want to build something entirely new. Um, on the way to getting to building something new, I think that folks are doing some legislative work and Dara, you talked a little bit about it. If you wanna just give us a quick overview because I think you, there's a piece of legislation that you're championing around this conversation. Um, and I would love for folks to hear a little bit about it. Yeah, sure. And, um, you know, giving all the snaps to Maria and saw you guys hit it right on the head. Um, and yes, we are working on a bill called Counseling Not Criminalization. Um, the Federal School Discipline Coalition actually has a package of bills, right? As Maria is saying, there's so much around the schools that need to be done that it's not just going to be one legislation that will fix all of this. We have a legislative package, which I'll put in the chat. But the first, you know, our number one bill, our first bill is Counseling Not Criminalization. And what that does is make sure that schools use Title I funding for counseling um, instead of <clears throat> being able to hire um, SROs and have, you know, have, have police officers in their school. As I said, we started in 2008, and it has taken us this long to get a congressperson to have the courage to put our briefs and everything we do into language. So what this does is gives a school district the opportunity. They can opt in or opt out and say, you know, if they say we are not going to have SROs in our schools and, and um, you know, remove them completely, as we said, Maria, from all around the school. Now we understand and know if there's a fire, if somebody, you know, has a baby, if someone, you know, whenever EMT is called to anywhere, law enforcement comes. That's outside of that realm. But we, the same, like I was telling you, no more police officers sitting on the corner with the traffic car, with the um, crossing guard, right? No more police officers just roaming around, just away from the school. And if the school district agrees to that, then they will get extra funding towards their Title I for counselors. We have schools that have SROs, but no social workers. Right. And again, y'all want, I forgot to call them out. The, the American Social Workers Association does not support SROs um, not being in schools. And so people know that's the white social worker group. Now there is a black social workers group, right? Again, with a bunch of deltas in there, that's a black women um, who do support that. And they're on this with us. And that's the black social workers, but not the white social workers. Just so you know that, call them out. These clinicians, we trying to give y'all money to do your job better and they don't support this so i put it in the chat box the um bill we got um representative ayanna presley democrat from massachusetts um representative omar Ilion, rep democrat from right minnesota Ilion omar and then representative bowman who's new to congress and but he came to congress those from new york 
he was a teacher and this is what sent him to go run for office is he was tired of seeing this. And so he's on this bill. He's also the vice chair of the committee where this sits with Representative Bobby Scott. So as I said before, Congressional Black Caucus member who's the chair of Adam Labor, who still does not believe that law enforcement should not be in schools. So we're working, this is our first time having this, sorry, this is the second Congress. We got it introduced in 115. The reckoning of that summer caused this. Um, and so we have that bill that will do that around Title I and also um, $50 billion, I'm sorry, five, um, $5 million extra, $50 million extra towards counseling. We're trying to move that number up, <clears throat> but we know we need counselors. We know we need this. We also know that students um, need to be safe in other ways. So we have CASA, which is keeping all students safe, which is ending restraint and seclusion. So those people don't know, you cannot restrain, they restrain, tie up a child. There's called seclusion boxes where they put them in. There are children who come to school and spend all eight hours in them boxes, just so you know. And the box is only, you know, it's kind of like solitary confinement. Um, and so this still goes on. Now you cannot do that in acute care. I wish a hospital would try to tie up a child, right? That's a, pro that's a problem. You cannot do that in your house. Tie your child up and put them in a the closet and so they coming to get you, right? You cannot do that. You're not supposed to do that in juvenile justice systems, right? We know it happens, but okay. But you know where it's not, where it's okay to do? In schools. And again, who's blocking it? NEA and AFT. Our teachers have to do this. How else will we protect these students? How else will we do it? And so they continue. We do know there are solutions. We have seen schools who had 99% restraint seclusion. They tied children up and people went in and taught them about how to take care of children with disabilities, who in Pennsylvania is where this program really worked, went from 99% to 2% in five years. So don't tell us we don't know how this works. We do know how it works. You have to have the political will, congressional members, to stop harming our children. And Black women, Black young girls, are. this is done to them at a higher rate. And queer, queer children too, LGBTQ, that is done to them at a higher rate. And then we have protecting schools and um, children in schools ending um, corporal punishment. It, that's mostly in the South. We still got 18, 19 states that have corporal punishment in them. Now, here's where NEA, AFT are okay, and they support this bill. So when you tell me it's not politics, why do you think they support this bill? What is not in the South? Unions. Unions are not in the South, so they're like, oh yeah, we support that one. So don't talk to us about politics and what's going on here. And then we also partnered with Gleason, who works around LGBTQ communities, and they have a school safety um, uh, bill as well. And I'll put those all in the chat box and send them out. And I put my email address in there. If you have any questions about these bills, let me know. If you want to join us on these meetings, let me know. If you can't join the meeting, I will give you the staffer. They need, these Congress people need to hear from this community because they think it's just us. Oh, you guys are just, I, my constituents don't care about law enforcement in school. I know you guys are doing a lot of work and I love it, but a lot of people do a lot of local work. Don't get me wrong, all politics is local, but it's also on a federal level. And since these Democrats can't get much done, they could get these things done and help us out. So that's our package that we're working on. And again, we work on a package deal. There is also a bill based on push out. It's called Ending Push Out by Representative Presley. Um, that right from Monique Morris's book. Now we we don't not we don't not support that bill. It wasn't strong enough. So we're working with Miss Presley to make that bill strong. She was like, I was like, oh no, no, no. Like just so you know, it gives competitive grants. So just so you know what that means is what school district you know gonna compete for a, 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 bill, a grant to help black women, black young black, they not doing it now. So I was like, Miss Presley, this is not gonna work. You gotta do either formulated grant, which means they look, look at the whole country, do a formulation and say, right? Or you do a pilot project where you pick certain areas of the country. You say, we're gonna do 50 schools you know, 10 in the South, 10 in the West, and then make them do it. So those kinds of push out is a really good bill. We just got to make it stronger. And then we're going to add it to the package. Deal. Okay, thank you so much. I see that we are pretty much at time. There are so many more questions that I wanted to get to. I wanted, could we use terms that some folks might be new to, like we talked about abolition. Some people might be like, what's the connection here? Um, we talked about um, the material change. Saudi, you talked about young people are witnessing the material conditions of their communities. I think you got into that a little bit. Maria, you were talking about the momentum in Oakland, Phoenix, San Francisco. I want to know, like, how did that happen? How did we get there? 
there's so much that we could unpack here, but we just do not have the time in this moment. So with the last minute or two that we have left, if folks can just talk about like how people can, what's your action item for everybody? What's your call to action? Where should they follow you? How should they keep up with you? Um, what is it that you want people to do? I'll take a little liberty and encourage folks to follow Girls to Gender Equity at GGENYC. Um, on our um, Police Free Schools website, we've created a map of incidents where Black girls and girls of color were assaulted by school cops, but we also are creating toolkits for like, how do we get to where we want to get? Um, so hopefully folks will check out the link and I'll drop it into the chat. Um, Maria, where should we go next? Absolutely. Organize. Everyone at whatever positionality they are, you have to organize. If you aren't an educator, organize and make interventions. I think what's clear is that the teacher unions have been a problem in a lot of different places, not just nationally, right? So one of the biggest hurdles that I faced organizing in New York was the UFT, right? So just trying to make sure that wherever you are, you're organizing. If you're a parent, an educator, a school administrator, a community member, more importantly, if you are a young person, right? Your, your vision for education matters and it has to be central to all the organizing. So join an organization. Uh, visit policefreeschools.org. It is our new website that we've done with the Alliance for Educational Justice that highlights all the incredible organizing. It highlights GGE, it highlights Philadelphia Student Union, all the incredible organizing on the ground that's happening, policefreeschools.org. There's a join the fight, uh, subscribe, and then also do some education and challenge yourselves on these narratives that we are perpetuating, that we perpetuate. Black girls are not dangerous. Uh, black young people are not super predators, right? We embody some of that stuff when we're asking questions like, well, what, when do I call the cops? Never, <laughs> never, right? There are particular interventions that we can do that school districts could implement, but it starts with ourselves. Right, so let's do the work of, of educating ourselves, of connecting to movement, of listening to those that are directly impacted by these systems of oppression, particular policing and institutional violence. Um, and then question, anytime you hear conversations about, well, we can't do this, we can't do that, that is not coming from a frame of abundance, right? That is coming from a frame of scarcity. And there are so many things that, um, that these uh, institutions have defunded, like education. Right, so maybe we should think about why they're defunding education, but not defunding the police. Take us home, Sadia. Um, yes, I would just echo everything that Maria said, right? Organizing is the most powerful things that our communities do, right? Because we know that the powers that be are also very organized, but they're not organized around liberation. They're organized around our suffering, right? For their profit and their gain. So I say organize, find an organization, build an organization, center directly impacted people's voices in leadership, right? Because I often see an organizing directly impacted folks may get uplifted for a platform, but not actually centered in the grounded structural organizing work and the strategy. And we have to understand that abolition is a vision, right? It's an analysis and it's an organizing strategy. It's all three of those things, right? We have to have a vision of where we want to go. We have to have an analysis, right? Because abolition currently is an, uh, it has evolved, right? From when they were slave catchers, right? That was the initial context of abolition. And we're talking about not making sure slave catchers are in our children's schools. So I just offer up, we have to organize, we have to analyze, we have to build power. Um, and we have to understand that this we're in this for the long haul, right? We're doing our part and our generation to prepare our babies to take this on for the next. So I put all info for folks who want to be involved. Our city, our schools is a really great coalition of educators, parents, and teachers in Philadelphia. Highly uplift them. And I also put a bunch of different acts um, of how you can be involved in different organizing work around abolition. Um, so yes, thank you to all the panelists. Thank you, Ashley, for being an amazing facilitator. So grateful for this opportunity and for your leadership. Thank you so much love to each of you. I appreciate you and your time and your energy here. Um, I appreciate everyone who listened. Please, please, please follow these links. Follow these folks. They're doing incredible work. Um, you know, don't just be uncomfortable. Sit and, you know, sit with the discomfort and then let it move you to action. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of the conference and we thank you for your attentiveness. Oh my goodness. Don't hang up yet. Don't leave hang yet. <laughs> wait, wait. Oh my goodness. You all were amazing. And this conversation unfortunately has to end now, but I'm hoping 
that just like the other panel that you all will come back soon because you know BGEA we're good for um, holding a you know separate conversation and just centering this conversation so please look out for email I'm going to send out the invite because there's just so much that you all share I also want to say to remind people that these sessions are recorded so like me, I can't really fully, uh, you know, kind of appreciate everything. I like to go back and to watch. And so they'll have the ability to do that. And then we also will have a transcript of all the great resources and information and upcoming events and all the ways that people can get involved and support that was put in the chat that's going to be sent out to everybody. So don't worry, you're going to get the information. Ashley, Saudia, Maria, Dara, Thank you so much. Thank you. You set this up so great for what our keynote address is going to be. We talked a little bit about the abolitionist, you know, uh, education. And so, you know, Dr. Bettina Love is coming up um, for our lunchtime keynote. And so looking forward to that. And so hopefully you all be able to join us for that um, and to continue to, you know, just kind of in the spirit of what is it that we need to do to change our system. So thank you so much, ladies. You were wonderful. And Ashley, thank you for being our moderator.